the uh, Ehrlich uh, 3D graphics engine. Um, today I'm going to uh, give an introduction. I'm going to start with a, uh, a tech demo. I'm going to talk a bit about what Ehrlich is and, and what it can do for you. I'm going to go through some basic concepts uh, and there'll be questions, comments, links at the end. Um, I had uh, talked about going through a, a setup. It's actually pretty easy to get set up with it, um, but I didn't think that really um, would carry over well on a, on a presentation a presentation on the screen because it would uh, be too hard to read and stuff. So during the question periods afterwards, uh, if somebody what has some questions about how to get the environment set up or installing it, uh, we can stay afterwards and look at that. Uh, I'm Dennis Farron. I'm a co-founder of Drop Echo Studios LLC with Ben Ventries. Uh, ben wasn't able to make it here today. Uh, anyway, we use the 3D graphic, the Ehrlich engine for the 3D graphics uh, in our game engine. Um, Ehrlich itself is an open source project uh, released by Nicholas Gearhart. Uh, we didn't write Ehrlich, and we're not even contributors to it. We just have the users of it. Uh, I'm going to start with a, a tech demo, just kind of show what a program using uh, Ehrlich looks like. Uh, this is the code blocks workspace that uh, you get when you um, open uh, the zip file from Ehrlich. Uh, you can also use it with Visual Studio, uh, but for our own engine, because we have some dependencies on uh, C11 and GCC, we use code blocks. Uh, and I'm going to start with the tech demo. Project. Activate it. And uh, every Ehrlich uh, demo starts with some way to select what driver. Uh, you can run it with Direct3D or OpenGL. Um, you have to uh, make a special build to get the Direct3D support, and I haven't put that build on here, so we're going to be using OpenGL today. This is uh, just a, a basic level that the Ehrlich engine is loading. Uh, what we're watching right now is a, uh, I think it's a, a, some kind of, I forget what the name of it, but it's basically a, a camera uh, path node that you can add and, and have the camera follow a path through the, uh, through the level. Uh, as you can see, it has texture, sliding, 3D. And here in a sec, after the animation gets done, it should drop us off down inside this, uh, where, where there's some uh, animation. Okay, yeah, here, here's uh, also is showing uh, various texture effects. The uh, lady running here is an animation uh, that the, uh, that's been loaded in, inside the level. You have various particle effects and things like that. And uh, so yeah, that's what a basic, uh, basically what an Ehrlich uh, engine game looks like. Uh, there's ways to make it look better or you can have it come up with inputs, uh, but this is sort of the baseline of what it looks like. So, Earlicked, it's a uh, 3D graphics engine. It basically is like a wrapper for OpenGL or DirectX. Uh, it's written in C++. There's also a C Sharp wrapper from like 2011, I think, but I only use it in C Sharp. I mean, I've only used it in C++. Uh, it's cross-platform. It works in the Mac, uh, Linux, and on Windows. And it's a uh, liberally licensed open source uh, project under Zlib, so uh, you can use it. You don't have to DPL your whole game or whatever. Uh, it, here, there's some screenshots here of some games that it's used in. Uh, there's uh, Tuxcart is a um, probably the most well-known one. And uh, then I, I put that screenshot on there. That these two screenshots came from the Ehrlich website. I put that second screenshot on there to show an instance of making it a much different looking game. I don't know for sure, but I'm guessing that they achieved the different look in there, mainly using textures. And then just right here, this is, uh, it looks kind of strange because it's just a test level where I was putting, trying to put as many control points on the terrain as I could, but that's some smooth meshes generated uh, by the engine that uh, Ben and I have been working on. So, what does Ehrlich do for you? 
Well, first of all, besides 3D graphics, you can also get 2D graphics. It uh, abstracts over OpenGL and Direct 3D, um, allowing you to have one, it abstracts the hardware interface and the scene management. So there's two basic things that it does. Is one is if you want to switch from DirectX to OpenGL, you don't have to change your code. Uh, and the other thing is that, uh, at least with OpenGL and I, I think DirectX as well, if you write against the raw, live, uh, the raw uh, OpenGL uh, implementation, you have to manage all of your transformations uh, as you go down the scene. And this, the, this will handle the scene management for you, and, and, and I'll talk about that. Uh, it has some basic game engine functions. Uh, I've, in the game engine that I'm working on, I've ended up not using very many of these simply because I have extra attributes of things that I want to save and load. Uh, but it, it can, the, the basic game engine uh, functions can be used. You can load textures, meshes, and levels, which I do use the textures and meshes. It'll do some collision detection. Uh, it's, it's pretty basic collision detection, but it is handy if you have a, um, a mesh and you need to find out uh, what triangle is. is uh, hitting another triangle. And then it will also handle input devices for you. So talking about abstracting over OpenGL or Direct3D, this is uh, the screen again from the tech demo. And um, on the right, or well, I guess it would be, yeah, you're right, um, you have where you can select that. And then on the uh, left is an example of the code. It's basically just an enum. Uh, besides OpenGL, DirectX, Direct 3D9, Direct 3D8. Uh, there's also two software uh, 3D uh, video implementations, which are actually uh, pretty good. They're not very fast, um, but it, it's just kind of neat that they're there. And then the one for null uh, is basically an, uh, a nullary uh, driver that allows you to test your code without actually having to have a, a window for it. And uh, then the code to create um, a window is basically say create device driver type and it will, um, you say whether you want to be window or full screen and so forth. So, scene management. This is uh, an example of what raw OpenGL code looks like if you don't have a, a, a framework helping you with it. And basically what's going on here is you've got to, uh, every time that you want to draw something different, you have to push the previous matrix, which the matrix is sort of the um, transformation that's going on on your data. You have to push that matrix, and then you can rotate and change color and go down, and then you have to remember to pop exactly many, as many times as you push. It's a lot like assembly language programming, push and pop versus actually having functions. Um, and the image to the side of this is uh, not anything real. It's just I went to this recursive drawing app, and you can draw a shape and then put it on there and then turn it and draw it again. And I thought that was a good analog for what a uh, for, for what's going on when you're writing straight OpenGL code. On the other hand, if you are programming in a library that does scene management for you, uh, such as Earlick, although Earlick is not the, uh, the only one that does this, of course, um, what you can do is you can have uh, nodes with children, and the orientation and the size and so forth of all the children can inherit from the parent node. Uh, and so when it comes time to draw your scene, uh, Earlick will actually walk your tree of nodes and do all the transformations for you uh, so that you don't have to. So uh, I'm going to uh, go to another tech demo to show game engine functionality. And by the way, these are all, this is entirely based off examples that come uh, with, the, uh, with the Earlick download. And uh, so it's really good for uh, getting a, uh, an idea of how to do something. A lot of times what I'll do is I'll start with the, the, tech de the, the, the example of code that is close to what I need, and, and I'll either add to it or copy it in, into uh, what, uh, what, you know, to the program where I need to use it. So here's another driver selection screen again when I use OpenGL. And um, these are, this is some good examples of some of the functionality of uh, game engine functionality. I have uh, user input so I can go for I can, you know, can handle the, the uh, buttons and the mouse. Uh, this red triangle here uh, is the triangle collision detection. So uh, what it's doing is it's casting a ray uh, where that, uh, that bright colored dot is and highlighting what triangle I hit. 
Uh, one way that this could be useful is say you wanted to make like uh, maybe a level editor and you want to be able to pull on the terrain and, and move it with the mouse. Uh, using this, using the code from this example, you can find out what triangle the cursor's on. Uh, it's also showing uh, animation. So these meshes were uh, loaded from files by the Ehrlich engine, and uh, some of the meshes have uh, animation uh, stored in the mesh file. <laughs> yeah, gets pretty silly. Okay, and then also uh, it will do user interface for you. So, go here. So this is a, um, a user interface that's drawn by Earlet. Uh, and it looks like buttons and text boxes and so forth, and for the most part actually functions that way. Uh, but they're actually all managed and drawn by Ehrlich, so it's getting the mouse input and drawing everything. Uh, a lot of games uh, would use a technique like this because that way on all the different platforms you can still have the same interface. Uh, especially if you were, I don't know if anyone's used Ehrlich on a console game, but especially if you were to be on a console, that, that would be something that you would usually do is have the program draw its own uh, user interface rather than rely on the operating system. Uh, there's also, uh, I'm, I can't remember if I'm going to show it today, but there's also, it's also possible to integrate uh, Earlicked with uh, native Windows controls. Uh, and I actually only just saw that um, the other day when I was going over these examples again, so that's pretty cool. Uh, all right, so. Uh, like I said, it's going to be kind of uh, a little bit more code light than uh, I had originally thought, just because it's not easy to read code on a, on a small on a screen from a distance. Uh, but I wanted to show a little bit of code to show uh, one of the reasons why uh, Ben and I uh, have been using Earlicked is it's really easy to use. Uh, for instance, the basic thing to get started to create a window with it is called Create Device, and it gives you a pointer to the device which you can. Uh, then do other things with. Uh, but what you do is you pass in the enumeration for the um, driver, the window size, um, whether you want 16 or 32 bit color, full screen, uh, stencil buffer, which has to do shadows, vsync, and then this event receiver. Uh, the previous example uh, that I showed with the, uh, the GUI, uh, when you click something, uh, what will happen is that if you pass an event receiver object, it's the one that will receive um, those events were clicks and keys and so forth. Once you've, uh, once you've created your device, the next uh, thing is you just create your manager objects. Uh, the two main, there's more than uh, this, but the two main manager objects are the, um, the iVideo driver manager and the scene manager. And almost all of the API can be accessed um, through this. There's also a, a GUI manager that you use to access buttons. Um, but I won't go into that uh, further. So for the video driver, uh, one of the main things the video driver does is drawing 2D images and drawing lines on the screen. So basically anything that doesn't involve keeping track of a scene node of which there's, um, the uh, scene nodes basically have to do with the hierarchical thing. Anything that's not hierarchical, something that you draw yourself, um, usually will be through the video driver thing. Uh, you also use it to load textures, um, and then finally it's used to call begin and scene, and that, uh, the main purpose of that, I, I believe, is to uh, tell the engine that it's okay to swap pages, because if you were to draw on the buffer between page swaps, it might not work uh, correctly. Anyway, and then at the bottom here, there, here's some uh, code. This is an example of how to draw a 2D image with the uh, driver, and uh, what we're doing is we're passing it a, a, a list of an array of images, actually, uh, position, their size, and um, the color. I can't remember whether the color parameters for the transparent color or whether that's uh, like a lighting or overlay color. Uh, anyway, so here's um, a 2D example. And uh, what 
other people like 2D graphics. Actually, I, I want to stop and for a sec um, talk about this. So a lot of um, the difference between doing a 2D game and doing a 3D game, it is a lot more work to do a 3D game. It uh, you have to you have textures, which are basically images. You have meshes and so forth. Uh, but it's not all bad. Um, if you do a 2D game, you're basically needing to do art that looks, if, if you want like a nice symmetric thing or something like that, you're needing to do art that looks three-dimensional. And uh, so one of the reasons why I like to just work on a game stuff that's just already 3D is that way you can just have the 3D engine do it and you have the choice of changing you know, what perspective you're looking at from. Uh, but it is definitely harder to do that. And if you want to make a 2D game, you can use Earlink to do that. Um, a lot of the capabilities are very similar to SDL, uh, but it's just basically using part of part of the API. Yeah. Should have wore shorts and a t-shirt. <laughs> So here's a uh, 3D graphics uh, example. I'm not really sure what's up with this highlighted square here in the example. I guess it's just showing alpha blending. Um, but it's showing, uh, basically there's some animation going on here. Uh, this whole background right here with the, um, the, the blocks and the floor, I was actually drawn with uh, one call um, to, the, uh, to the engine. I, I think that's... Um, purpose of passing in there. I haven't done a whole lot with 2D graphics, so I think that's the purpose of passing the array to it. And then I'm pretty sure the yearly logo up here also is drawn with the 2D graphics. Alright, so the scene manager. Uh, the scene manager is kind of like the, uh, the basis of the the whole API. Um, a lot of times when uh, somebody's learning uh, programming or learning API, they want to know like what's the core, what's the actual stuff that you know makes things work. And in a lot of APIs, the answer is well, there's not one core. It's just kind of you know everything. Uh, in your look, there is. There's the scene manager. Almost everything is accessed through the scene manager. There's limitations to that architecture. Uh, and if if we talk about um, trade-offs of Earlink versus other things, uh, we can get into that. Um, but the benefit of it is it's very simple. Uh, you know, if you want to like add a shape to um, your scene, or where do you go to add a, you know, a light or something, the answer is always the same. It's, it's a, a member on a scene manager. So the way you get your scene manager is once you've created your device or create a device, you uh, call get scene manager and store the pointer to it. Uh, there's an example here of some code where what we're doing is we're saying scene manager, load the mesh from this file, and then we're saying scene manager, add an animated mesh scene node using the mesh that we just had you load. And then you can set the position, set the animation speed, and so forth. Uh, and this is also a good time to talk about what are uh, scene nodes. So the scene nodes are basically almost anything that is a game object is going to be either a scene node or maybe composed of multiple scene nodes. Um, there are a tree you can have, you know, every scene node can have children. Uh, in this example, we ha in the uh, picture at the top here, we have several uh, different cubes. They're all different uh, scene node instances. And um, there's a really cool demo here uh, that gives a good example of what, our, what uh, kinds of scene nodes you can have. Okay, so this is showing um, both lighting uh, and uh, mesh scene nodes, as well as uh, I think there could be some shape scene nodes here with hexagons, but I'm not quite sure if that's, if that is or not. But anyway, so even the lighting uh, is actually a scene node, and the reason, reason 
uh, a light is a scene node um, is that you might want to move the light, you might want to uh, you know, position it a certain way, or even attach an animator to it. Uh, scene nodes have a property that, oh sorry, question? Uh, are all lights in the engine dynamic like that, or are there static lights as well? Uh, I think there are static lights. Uh, this example is specifically showing off a dynamic light, so I think most of the time it, uh, there's static, but um, I'd have to, I'd have to look that up more closely. I'm pretty sure though that you can have uh, both kinds. I'm not sure if you can have a non-point source light. You can have a point source light that's really far away, but I can't remember if you can have a non-point source light. Because I remember having that problem. I was the, uh, the game I'm working on is 3D graphics, but from a 2D perspective. And I wanted fairly even lighting, and what I ended up having to do was put a point source really far away and give it a really huge radius. You couldn't get a direction light to work? Uh, they, I can't remember if it's because they're not in there, or more likely they're in there and I just wasn't using it right. I think, I think there are direct lights in there. Uh, okay. Anyway, so, uh, and then we have some uh, particle uh, effect nodes here. And I think that, if, if I remember correctly, and I was just looking at the code, I, I haven't done too much with shadows, but I think in this example they actually attach the shadow uh, to the dwarf as a scene node attached to the dwarf. Uh, so sometimes shadows can be scene nodes as well. All right, and then of course, um, most important part, you have your uh, game loops. So once you've set up your managers, uh, you basically will have a, a while loop uh, device run will be over if your window is closed. Uh, the you know, return false if the window is closed. So you say, well, the window is open. Uh, begin scene, scene manager draw all, driver end scene. And um, it actually does matter uh, whether you do things before or after the scene manager draw all. Um, if you, I, I believe, if you do some certain kinds of drawing. If you do some certain kinds of drawing, especially 2D stuff, you might want to draw it afterwards so that it draws on top of things. And uh, I didn't show it here, but if you have a GUI, make sure to call uh, GUI draw all. Otherwise, you'll spend all day trying to figure out why your GUI doesn't show up. Okay. So uh, I'm going to run this example for custom scene node. And uh, the reason why this custom scene node uh, example also shows the game loop is that the custom scene node executes uh, when the game loop runs. And uh, so basically, uh, scene node is an interface or an abstract base class. And you can uh, implement it yourself. Uh, and then there's a render method that gets called and you can use uh, methods to draw uh, during the render. You can draw using the driver, or you could do other things like maybe you know, rotate another scene node or whatever you want to do. I don't know if you'd want to rotate another scene node though in that method. So uh, in this example, um, what's going on is, is this uh, tetrahedron here is uh, being drawn dynamically by the custom scene node, and every rotation of it, or you know, every, every frame that's being drawn from it is basically an iteration of our game loop because the render method on this is being called during the scene manager draw all, and the scene manager draw all is in our game loop. Another thing that's common on the examples to do during the game loop is uh, after it draws the seen uh, every certain number of frames, in this case it's doing it only every 100 frames, uh, it calculates the FPS. And uh, again, the FPS is very simple, it's just a, a method call on the driver, you say get FPS. Uh, the reason why you don't want to do it every frame is that it would slow your frame rate down if you were changing your window title with every frame. So that's the end of the, uh, the slides. Uh, we just kind of covered uh, what Ehrlich is, uh, did some feature demo, and, and just a few basic concepts. 
uh, if people are interested in um, sort of how you get the environment set up for uh, using the early code blocks, um, we can go over that uh, afterwards. Do any questions? Uh, do we have uh, any questions? Yeah. I was going to ask if you use, uh, was it your edit? I, you know, I, I've, I've looked at it a bit because I really have a need for a good um, editor. Uh, but the problem I had was that it doesn't have any provision for totally dynamic attributes on a, on a node. It's kind of limited, isn't it? Right, right. It's very, I found it very limited, unfortunately. So do you have like a custom editor that you're working on? Or? Unfortunately, not yet. Um, the way that uh, the engine um, that Ben and I have written works is that uh, we actually have a domain-specific language for loading our shapes. And uh, that's written, that's in our scripting engine. Uh, and then we also have attributes that have to do with the, uh, the bullet physics uh, engine that we're using with it. And so for us, only being able to save the ear licked information with the level editor was pretty limited. You said you have a scripting engine? What kind of script do you use? Uh, so that, the, the, that's actually the, the main work um, that, that I've done on the engine and, and sort of like the original piece of it is I integrated uh, the IO scripting language uh, with it, which I didn't write IO either, but I, I put it together with your looking bullet. Uh, and basically the way it works is I, I made this, uh, since IO is dynamically typed, um, you can easily make domain specific languages in it or write kind of code that is also data, you know, kind of like the list sort of thing. So it's kind of like imagine if you had something like JSON but for specifying 3D objects. Uh, the way it works is like, say you wanted to make like a, like a robot with a, a head and two arms and two legs. Uh, what you would actually do is you would just write like head parentheses, or you would like write head, torso, parentheses, parentheses left arm, right arm, left leg, right leg. And then it, when it processes that, it would know, okay, now I've got this thing in parentheses. All these things in the parentheses go attached to the previous arm. So most likely uh, we'll end up doing some using that format also to save our information about levels, um, but it's not uh, fleshed out enough yet to, to do that with. Yeah. What are the engines out there we can compare this to? I mean, it's obviously a lot lower level and stuff like the UK and uh, Unity. Right. Right. So um, the direct competitor uh, with Earlicked uh, is called Ogre. And um, the difference between an engine like Earlicked and Ogre versus something like Unity or a more full-fledged engine um, is that the, uh, despite all that it does, Earlicked and, and I believe Ogre as well, um, they're much more uh, something that you can use as a library so that it's embedded in your project rather than your code being fully embedded in it. And in, in my case, I like that because that way I can combine it with other things. The built-in functionality that's there, I don't have to use, I can use something else. And, and now, obviously, I, I'm sure there's probably ways in the more featureful engines to turn off some of those things. Um, but it, you know, if I, don't, if I don't need those other features, then it's just easy to not have them. Plus the licensing too, right? Uh, yeah, so the licensing on Earlicked is uh, Zlib, so that's actually a good point. It, it's um, very liberal. You don't have to. You, you can contribute to the project, but you don't or contribute money, but you don't have to license. You don't have to um, buy a license to use in your game. How would you compare this to like 3.js or something like that? Um, I'm not really familiar enough with those to know, uh, but one thing I will talk about uh, is I think it's actually kind of cool that a couple of years ago. Not, not too long ago, it would have been, C++ would have been the default, and if you were going to make a game in like JavaScript or something else, you'd have to like justify that. Uh, but now, I think it's really, you almost have to say why make a game in C++, why not make a game in JavaScript or one of the higher level languages. Uh, and in our case, uh, the ideas that Ben started and I started with um, were we wanted to do some things with terrain, uh, mesh generation, and some things with AI that require a lot of processing power. And so I wanted to do a C++ engine um, so that I could have access to, the, to that computation. Uh, mm. I think there was a question back there. Yeah. Um, have you ever worked with open C graph? And so I actually looked at that um, because I, I almost, I, I very nearly uh, chose open scene graph over Earlicked uh, for the um, position of the scene manager for, for the graphics thing for, um, 
for the you know the whole game engine that, that we're building because we actually only need the scene management pretty much. Um, what there were two reasons. One was Ben was already familiar with Earlicked, and so he you know he was like, hey, you know, we, we know this, and you know, let's let's use it. Uh, the other thing was is that Open Scene Graph, um, it's a great visualization library. It's not really a game library. You could make a game with it, um, but it's not necessarily the primary target. It, it, it may seem like a subtle difference, uh, but I think that it does, you know, you do eventually run into some inconsistencies from one to the other. I, I think Open Scene Graph is, is interesting, uh, and if I were not making games, but if I were making just something that I wanted to visualize something in 3D, I think it would be a good choice. And then also, uh, while we're kind of circle back on Ogre versus Earlicked, um, the reason why we went with Earlicked over Ogre, even though Ogre actually has better integration with uh, bullet physics and um, is maybe a little bit more featureful, is that uh, Earlicked being easy to use, uh, Ben said that he, every time that he had tried to get Ogre to work, uh, he just you know, if he wasn't working directly off an example, if he tried to make it work from scratch, he was unsuccessful every time he tried to do that. And I'm not saying that Ogre is bad, but you know, it's just that was you know the, that was the, how we evaluated it. So. Yeah. Um, so most of the examples here are pretty low poly and simple textures does, does it do pretty well with you know what are, what are pretty normal poly counts uh, uh, this it's really hard to say um, performance and how good uh, something looks are so I mean there's there's so many variables on that yeah part of the reason why this stuff is low poly count is I think a lot of the examples the meshes uh, come from free assets right. uh, plus I, most of these examples are like Ten years old. Yes. Yeah, so. Right. Well, <laughs> they were great at the time. Yeah, yeah. but most of these examples <laughs> also run like yes. nine. Several of the examples run at like nine hundred frames per second. So. Right. <laughs> these, so these, the these run at nine hundred frames per second. So probably if you not know. all. I mean, like this in the for instance the screenshot in the example ran at two hundred twenty-two frames per second, and this is on a fairly old laptop. Okay. It, it, it's it, so. And I think that the for the question, the question about performance and how good it looks, I think, are kind of connected because it basically a lot of it comes down to how good you are at coaxing the performance out of the engine. Um, I have noticed some slowdowns on really huge poly count things, um, but another thing to keep in mind is that if you have a really large poly count world, um, you really need to have some uh, level of detail management uh, at that point. Even if you had a great engine, if you had no level of detail management, basically in terms of like dropping off, either either using lower resolution for other way things or dropping things off, you um, would pretty quickly run into other limitations in terms of it just being unmanageable. Another thing also, I, I can't remember if this, this may have been fixed or you may have hit, May have been fixed in one in the latest one. I'm not sure, but uh, for a long time, Earlick only supported uh, 64 or 16-bit indices. So if you had more than um, 64,000 uh, nodes in your mesh, uh, you would have to break it into smaller pieces to, to display it anyway. That's what I was about to say. If you if you use small models and build your world out of smaller chunks, it works pretty well. What what I found with and I, I'm going to go back to the very beginning here. Um, I don't know if it's it's probably not easy to see because it's a really small um, picture here. But this one down here, what I was experimenting with here is is for the the game that I was working on. I wanted uh, it was very important to me. I wanted to have smooth um, levels because in the game you're kind of it's kind of like a Sonic the Hedgehog kind of game. You're going you know you're a ball, you're rolling, and uh, your gear and, and and if you're going over jagged stuff, it's not going to be fun. You know stuck or fly off the surface or whatever. And um, what I was trying to do was I was trying, and then I, I wanted to, to, I realized it was hard to see the past. So I wanted to cut it into foreground, midground, and background so you could see it. And uh, when I would cut the mesh, it would look really ugly. And I, for the first approach I tried was to add more polygons and more nodes and make it a finer mesh. But no matter what I did, there was always that sort of, um, basic chunkiness to it. 
And so what I uh, ended up doing was I ended up implementing a tree-based uh, variable uh, grid. Variable, you know, the, the grid gets finer at the edges and uh, larger where it's, you know, where it doesn't matter as much. But then what I also did was I, I took the nodes that it's placing and I had it place the of the of the nodes at the lowest resolution it has. I had it intelligently move the nodes a little bit closer to where the virtual surface is, where, you know, where the surface would be if you had a perfectly fine grid. And by doing that, uh, I was able to get a lot smoother looking uh, curves um, than I could with resolution. So definitely, um, definitely like with the low poly count uh, models, I, know, I realize they look kind of like you know, 1990s-ish sort of stuff, but I think that you can achieve quite a bit uh, with it. Uh, no, what I did was I, um, I used an oak tree, um, but kind of an interesting variation on the oak tree. What, uh, what I did was, well, first, first of all, um, what I did was I started with, I downloaded some library code for something called Thin Plate Spline, which basically is you can put control points on a virtual surface. And it's basically, it's like the idea, of, well, you know, like the surface of a car fender or something, how it has a compound curve. But the Thin Plate Spline is like a mathematical description of that curve. And so, you get what, what you get is like a um, implicit surface. And implicit means that you don't get the points directly, but if you say, "Hey, is this point on the curve?" or "How far is this point from the curve?" it can tell you that. So it has this implicit surface, it's smooth. And then what I do is I I first place. I, I have a tree structure, but I need to place enough test points to at least kind of identify, you know, the rough outlines of the curve. And then what I did is closer to places that matter, and, and by places that matter in this example, it was either stuff that was close to the path, or a place that was close to the cutoff in the back where it cuts off so you can see sky. Anything's closer, either closer to places that matter, or if the slope was too um, too steep in that area, then I put extra points. And the way I put the extra points was to subdivide the tree. So an oak tree is. Or, well, in this case, it's a quad tree. Quad tree is basically, if you imagine like a checkerboard, it just has four squares in it, right? And then you take a piece, one piece of it, you put more, more. The places where you need more detail, you put more detail, and it's basically just a tree with four children, uh, four child nodes on each node. Uh, but what I'm uh, planning to change this to soon is a kind of a neat variation on this is that uh, due to some details of how my uh, triangulation algorithm works, uh, since it works on uh, perimeter, combining perimeters, it actually doesn't care if you have two nodes pointing to the same thing. And so uh, what I'm actually going to do is if two nodes, like if you want, instead of subdividing it to four, if you only needed like a binary thing, I'm going to have like both nodes uh, like left and right both point to one thing. So you have four children, but two of them point to one, and two of them point to the other. So that'll allow actually a, a hybrid uh, BSP tree versus op tree, uh, quad tree. And BSP tree is basically the same idea as the quad tree, but just you either cut it like this or you cut it like this. You know, you just cut it in twos. I find the quad tree easier to visualize because you always do the same thing at every node. And uh, then specifically, the thing I was talking about with placing the node intelligently, once you get to the final level, you, what you've got is, a, it's not a square really, what you've got is a volume. And all you're saying is somewhere in this volume, the, the, the point exists, it's on the surface. And um, so what I do is I actually take the, I, I, I probe the implicit surface at all the corners of the box, and then I take the average and I place the Note at the average. Wait, so I, well, I weight each coordinate by how close it is to the surface, and then I place it at the average. And so putting in their weighted average gives me, I hope anyway, I, I could be wrong in my math, but hopefully it gives me like a place within it. So I, I, what I think is kind of interesting to think about is that even though you may be dividing your space into squares, it doesn't necessarily mean that your output has to be a square. You can you can have your the thing. The square just means something interesting is happening inside the space. Any uh, other questions? Yeah. Can we see your game? Uh, unfortunately, it is 
sort of under down for repairs under construction. I'm, I'm reworking the uh, script binding library right now. Hopefully, maybe uh, six months from now, I'll give a presentation. About it. <laughs> Uh, I think you had a question. Well, uh, I'm, I have such a superficial understanding of what you're doing, but it sounds pretty awesome. Thanks. So your your algorithm, I mean, um, you're placing priority based on, uh, you know, the structures or uh, the implicit uh, surface. Right. Right. And so you're also providing higher resolution based on that, but you're also choosing other things as well, right? Right. So, so what I have is essentially a, um, it's basically an if statement. With, I, I have a, a method called split node. And um, what it says is it says split node, and it's the implementation of split node says, if my slope is too great, or I'm too close to, or if I'm close to um, one of these you know, boundary conditions, then recursively call split node again, and so forth. However, what it actually needs to say, what it actually says is, if the slope is too great, or I'm close to a boundary condition, unless I'm so small that I've reached the, the lowest resolution, then it oh, stops wow. it. Cool. But it's actually, that, that part of it, it's actually pretty simple. It's just basically saying, do this, you know, split the node or don't split the node. Okay. And then you, you can do various, you know, things with what are your, term, you know, what, what are your criteria for whether it is split the node or not. Yes. Is that like every frame? Or uh, no, that's for the uh, the mesh generation uh, one time. Okay. And uh, then what it does after that is it, uh, so it actually ends up generating this giant tree of nodes that are like points floating in space and they have no connection to each other. And then I have, if I remember right, I think I have like a method that I can say, given this rectangle of space that I'm interested in, return me a mesh that just covers just this rectangle of space. And then what I do is I do that for tiles. So you know how like Mario Brothers or various things have tiles? Well, I have tiles too, but they're just much bigger in their sections of smooth background that are generated from these meshes. And so that way it can have each mesh separated into a manageable chunk. Yeah, that would be that makes sense. I'm for a second there, I thought you were like, on the fly, you have like that was this, this <laughs> mesh. Oh, that would get pretty. Yeah, yeah that, you know, that would, that would, something was happening, then you, you know, put more resolution on it. But you mean just the whole level, right? So. That that would be pretty awesome. Um, but yeah, <laughs> the, 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 people have done similar on the fly stuff with voxel-based engines, and it's sort of been the you know the next big thing for for about eight years now. But uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, any other questions? Yeah. So you mentioned, I don't know if you said that this was cross-platform, I guess it says it right there. Um, what, what are the platforms? Uh, it is on uh, Windows, um, Linux, uh, most, just about any Linux uh, you can compile you can compile from source. It's on Mac. Um, I had some trouble with it on Mac. I ended up having to. Yeah. Um, hey. <laughs> anyway, uh, so I have a little bit of trouble with Mac uh, simply because I use a custom version of DCC or the latest version, uh, and Earlicked on Mac is uh, mainly the official release is with Xcode, and uh, if you use Xcode, that you probably won't have any trouble. But since I wanted to use it with DCC and code blocks, I had to uh, do some extra work. There may be some ports to BSDs or something, but I don't really keep up with that. I have a question. Earlier when there was the enum for outputs, what was Burning's video? Okay, so um, the, the both of those were so there's software video and Burning's video. The software video driver is very, very basic. The Burning's video driver is actually pretty neat. It's somebody, I don't even know who wrote this, but it's somebody wrote it's a software record. only, as in like rendering to an array colors in memory rather than video because someone wrote a software only video driver. So that is like spit out a 4D matrix basically? No, no, no. Uh, here, let me... Or, uh, uh, it is not perfect, but it's decent enough that when I accidentally run it with Bernie's video, I don't think, oh, you know, I'm in software, um, 
video mode, I think, gee, what's wrong with my OpenGL drivers? What's wrong with my video card? <laughs> <laughs> this is actually software. So what, what somebody has done is this is like emulating a video card, basically. What? This is all on the CPU, and this isn't a very powerful CPU either. And as you can see, they've implemented uh, texture uh, stretching. And you can see it's kind. Of, it's it's only making 11 FPS on this laptop. It was running at a couple hundred. Yeah, 200. Well, but that's no depends on which on yeah. which demo. But that's yeah, it, it's, it's probably about an order of magnitude at least yeah. slower than um, the regular one. But as you can see. Not only the fact that it's smooth enough, but also the fact that the fact that they've implemented these features. Because I mean, these features of having the vertexes come out, like have, this even having the vertexes line up, right? Like you don't see any um, like tearing or anything. That's actually pretty fantastic to be able to do that. I mean, you saw just a little bit right there, maybe like a little like line go white line go across it. Yeah. Um, but that's. It's tough to do with floating point numbers on the PC. I don't, I don't know what the video card does to make that come out better. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. One thing that makes this useful is that if you are having pro if you are in fact having problems with your OpenGL drive or your DirectX driver, or like whenever I first compiled the, my own version of this on Mac, I tested it with the Bernie's video because that way I could remove an extra variable and I didn't have to worry about whether it was working with the OpenGL on the library on the Mac. Yeah. So what other libraries are you using for your game development, like physics, uh, sound? So for physics, uh, we use the um, Bullet uh, physics engine. Uh, really, uh, really great engine. Um, maybe sometime I'll talk about it. Um, the, uh, for our scripting language, we use this uh, language called IO. That's a, it's a dynamically typed. Uh, it's kind of like, like Crossbow and Lisp and JavaScript. JavaScript. Uh, dynamically type uh, embeddable language. So, like the reason I chose that is that um, the interpreter for I/O uh, has very few external dependencies, so you can build it basically as a standalone thing and, and call. You can even have multiple instances of the interpreter, but I haven't used that feature yet. Uh, we we're going to we were going to use RackNet for um, network-based multiplayer, um, but we ended up dropping. Um, plans for the near term to do network-based multiplayer, so I, I took the RackNet library out. RackNet library is fine. I, I had made some attempt in college to write a um, network-based, you know, kind of multiplayer syncing stuff. The approach that RackNet took was completely different from the approach that I would have taken. It was probably, I mean, it's definitely more proven than anything I did, but anyway, so RackNet was nice, but we didn't end up using it. At least not right now. Uh, Earplane, uh, also nice. It's a sound um, library. Uh, it's by the same person who wrote Earlicked. Uh, basically, to make money, he gives away Earlicked for free and then charges for Earplane. So you do have to license that. Uh, there's a real dearth of good sound libraries on the PC, and Earplane's one of the few really good ones. Uh, but I don't include it by default in uh, my game engine distribution. I've actually got that on GitHub, actually. I don't include your claim by default simply because it's, it's not a free license. So have you considered using like SDL or OpenAL? Um, I, I had started out actually um, using SDL to, uh, before I was generating actual 3D meshes with some of my 3D code, I was using SDL to visualize them. Um, but SDL doesn't actually have 3D stuff built into it. You know, it's set in you know, merely a 2D library. Um, there's a there's a really cool roguelike engine called uh, LibT Code. Oh, and, yeah, yeah, awesome. yeah. And uh, that depends on SDL. And I've thought about implementing, uh, or I've thought about integrating LibT Code, uh, but I haven't gotten to that yet. The, the reason why that, and, and LibT Code is a 2D uh, library, and actually like a text mode game library, but it, I think it could be useful in any game because you can use it for uh, mini map generation and pathfinding and things like that. So, uh, anything else? All right. Uh, one more uh, question. Yeah. Uh, I was reading up on early before I got here, and it said it has uh, different bindings or wrappers. Uh, how would you recommend anybody trying to program to the to the wrappers instead of natively? 
if you're going to use C Sharp for your game, by all means use the C Sharp wrapper. I'm not sure how up to date the wrapper is because it's from 2011. It should be up to date for early 7.2 or 7.3, I think, but not, I don't know if anyone's updated for that. If you are using Earlicked and you want to use Earlicked and you don't have a problem with C, I would go ahead and use C. I wouldn't recommend C if you just want to make a game. Um, because it, there's a look, when you're writing um, native code, when you're writing uh, really complex code, um, it, it, and especially not having garbage collection, uh, it adds to development uh, effort. And so if you were just wanting to make just a simple I mean, like for instance, um, uh, Space Camp. Have you guys ever, anyone ever play Space Camp, the indie game? It's made in C Sharp, great game. Uh, obviously, I haven't seen the source code for it, for what their implementation looks like and stuff, but it you know, sounds like they had no problem with it. And they, I don't think they used the Erlich, but I just wanted to give an example. If, you can, if you're making a game like that, or, or even a fairly complex game, you can use C Sharp. You, know, you can use Java. Um, like I said, I, I, well, I was already familiar with C++. I, I got started out when, you know, in order to make any game, you had to, uh, you know, you kind of had to use C++. <laughs> But uh, yeah. nowadays, uh, I, yeah, nowadays I, I wouldn't actually recommend it unless you were actually wanting to make something that is going to do a lot of the computation. I would use, if I were writing from scratch, I would use a wrapper. Also, there may be ways to load native DLLs in C Sharp directly. It's a little more extra work, but I, I think you can do that too if the wrapper doesn't help for you. All right.